Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl podcast is sponsorship and ad-free thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about supporting your favorite podcast and becoming a patron, please check out patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Tough Girl podcast and help me to increase the amount of female role models in the media. All patrons will get their name on a dedicated patrons page on the Tough Girl website. All female patrons, $5 and above, are invited to join the closed Facebook group, The Tough Girl Tribe. Today, I'm delighted we're going to be speaking to Dr. Betty Holston-Smith, who is 79 years young and is currently running from anywhere between 60 to 100 miles per week. She's got the fitness levels of your average 30-year-old. During this episode, Dr. Betty is going to be sharing more about her early life, how she got into running, how she changed her life, how she trains, how she what she eats, how she copes on four hours of sleep a night. This is one incredible episode, jam-packed, full of information and top tips. Enjoy. Hello, and thank you for inviting me for this great opportunity to let people know exactly what I've done from the time I was like 29 years old when I was a smoker and eating junk food. And that was before McDonald's and the fast food uh, companies came into being. So I was just eating candy and potato chips and whatever I wanted. And I was 200 plus pounds and smoking. And I had gotten married, we had a daughter And by the time she was three years old, I was well over 200 pounds. Uh, We were playing outside in a park one day, and she tagged me and said, Mommy, 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 you can't catch me. (laughs) And she was right. I mean, I couldn't even catch my breath. And that sort of planted a little seed in the back of my mind somewhere. And I didn't make these changes overnight. But I did really try to take better care of myself and try to eat at least every now and then something that was um, more nutritious than a bag of potato chips. And nothing was working. And I think I tried that. At least I had it in my mind that I wanted to be more fit because of my daughter. I wanted to make sure I was around. Uh, as she was growing up. So I tried all of the crazy diets and I could take the weight off, but then it would come back because I didn't do a lifestyle change. So finally I ran into a radio talk, uh, call in talk radio show with the doctor who lived in my area. I live in the Washington DC area. And this doctor practiced medicine in that area, but I never really met him until a few years later. But I used to listen to him on the radio, his radio show every day. And I never really called in because people would call in with the kind of questions that I needed to ask him. And what I got from him was you have to take care of nutrition along with movement. You cannot just lose weight and expect to keep it off and expect to be healthy. So he advised for the movement part, get yourself outside at least three times a week and start off wherever you are. So every day, just go outside until you can manage walking or running or a combination of 30 minutes at a time without stopping. And he showed us how to take our resting heart rates because what you had to do was to get your heart rate 20 beats above the resting rate and keep it there for at least 30 minutes a minimum of three times a week, and that would strengthen the heart. Other exercises that do not do that do not strengthen the heart as efficiently, okay? That was the movement part. 
And the nutrition part, he says, here's what you need to eat. You need to eat fruits and vegetables and whole grains and beans and seeds and nuts. And then this was 1969 in the early 70s. He was into eating every now and then meat. Well, over time, I went beyond what his advice was back in the early 70s. And it's, I'm now 79 years old, nearly 80. And here's what I eat every day. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, dried beans that I cook myself, seeds and nuts. And I also eat every day um, ginger. So I did the movement thing. I started off one day a week or two days a week or whatever time I had. And I made my way all the way up to 30 minutes of first walking. And then I found out that I really was very passionate about running. So 30 minutes of running without stopping. First, it was three days a week. And then it was five days a week. And then it was seven days a week. And then it was not only seven days a week, but on some of those days, I'm running twice a day. So I really fell in love with running. Running was the core of my life, okay? As far as my fitness was concerned, everything in my life started supporting my running. So... It was very easy for me to strike out things that did not support my running. You know, my bag, bags of potato chips, I loved them. I really did. The little greasy, salty potato chips. No more. So once I got started with this running passion, I just took my life and put it in the hands of my running. So I could tell the difference. I could feel the difference. I could run longer. I could run without stopping. I've gotten down to the place where I've, I've run ultra marathons now. And these longer ones, uh, six day races uh, right now. Well, with the virus, there are none available right now. It's a virtual. But the last six-day race was last year, uh, 2019, in Florida. And I can run. I've run six days and six nights without a real break, except I do... I, I, for that race, I did 40 minutes snippets of sleep. You know, a few minutes here and a few minutes there. Over the spread it out over the six days. So I run six days and six nights without a break, and I have no need for recovery. I'm not tired to the point where I'm going to drop because I'm so tired. I haven't really had a rest to sit and put my feet up. It just works. And it's not that I have any special genes. Now, for all of my life, as far back as I can remember, I slept four hours a night. And then I have 24 hours in the day. So I've got 20 hours to do whatever else I need to do. And that's another reason why I can run very long because I can get up early and go running. Well, I don't do that as often nowadays as I used to when things were a little different, um, at least at least here in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, females just would not go out in the dark 
alone, depending on where you are, of course. So um, running has taken charge. And there are other things that happen to me, um, good things that happen to me um, because of my lifestyle. Uh, every now and then, I am monitored by Johns Hopkins, which is a, a great research hospital here in the Washington, well, in the Baltimore area, not far away. They have been monitoring me because they've been doing this um, longitudinal study on aging and energy. And they know that I get the proper amount of deep, rapid eye movement sleep in four hours simply because my body can take me there to REM or rapid eye movement sleep immediately. And I stay there for four hours in that dreaming sleep. And then in four hours, I'm done and my body brings me back up. Most people take three or four hours to get there and another two to three to four hours to get up. And then they're there for four hours, so you can count, you know, four and four and four. You think they're getting a, an awful lot of sleep, but it's not quality sleep. So I get quality sleep. I do not nap during the day. And I'm awake and alert to do whatever it is that I need to do uh, during the day. So I'm really very, very busy. I, I'm still coaching. And I do relationship-based coaching because this is not like me training for a 10K or training for a marathon or training for an ultra marathon. I run, the kind of running I do allows me to do any kind of races I would like to do. Like I do not and have never once I started this routine, got on its path back in the early 70s, no carbo loading. <laughs> you know, people say, I'm going to carbo load because I got to run Boston or whatever. I don't do, I don't need to do carbo loading because the food that I eat just to, to live, just to be active and all during the day, why should I change it to run? I don't need to change it to run, okay? Because it allows me to have the energy that I need and um, the, the body is amazing. And most of us, a lot of the runners especially, will not, do not respect the body. They do things to the body that will interfere with their performance, even running, and they don't realize it. Um, I, li I listened, I still listen to this doctor that I talked about earlier, Dr. Merkin, M-I-R-K-I-N, and he does have a website with, with free website with free information about fitness, nutrition, and health. And he stays up to date on the latest research coming out. And what he does is he translated, he translates it from medical ease to just everyday language. It's so easy and so understandable to read his um, presentations online and, and it's easy to follow it because he's making so much sense. For example, some years ago, there was some research about the stretching, like you stretch in before a run, during a run, right after a run, the stretch and interfere with performance. And the research said, yes, it does. And doc, that's one of Dr. Merkin's papers. And he always quotes 
in his papers, he quotes the sources, whatever university, whatever research group, and they are they are all NIH, uh, National Institute of Health, NIH, or Harvard University research, or any kind of research one would respect. So I read this about stretching, and I said, aha, I am going to check this out for myself. So I started, and I continued this. This is like 30 years later. Here I am getting up, and again, it's great to have 20 hours because I do two hours worth of, of um, strengthening flexibility, balance, and relaxation every morning. I end all of that with Tai Chi. I've been practicing Tai Chi at least for 40 years. So Tai Chi at the end sort of pulls all that I've done with the stretching and relaxation and the flexibility and the balance. It pulls it all together. And then I'm ready to do whatever comes comes my way or whatever I've planned. If it's running a, a marathon or a six-day race or whatever, I'm ready. I found the difference between not stretching before, during, or after a running event and stretching and doing all of that in the morning early on. For me, it's early on. And my performance, I mean, my body responds to that. So even after a six-day race, there's no need for me to stretch or do anything. You know, my six-day races have either been in um, Arizona or in Florida. And after the race, if it ends at nine the next morning, by 12 o'clock after all of the events and giving of the medals and whatever else, I'm on an airplane going back, coming back home. And then what I do is get back to my regular routine. And then I'm back to my sleeping routine. I usually go to sleep, go to bed and go to sleep at about midnight. And I'm up at four doing my exercise, <laughs> doing my morning routine. And my body responds to that. I grew up in a place where there was all around me virgin woods. You know, I'm nearly 80, so uh, let's look at way back when I was a young kid. Uh, we played in the woods, and we did everything in the woods. I fell in love with Mother Nature, and I tried to figure out how Mother Nature operated because she would give us these beautiful wildflowers, you know, and and we could clock it by the time of year. And I am, by the way, one of um, six kids and my mother and father and my family growing up. And <laughs> I was trying to figure Mother Nature out. I've always been a person to wonder about things. I have to, I, curiosity may have killed the cat, <laughs> but it keeps urging me on. So I'm looking at these beautiful yellow flowers, and I wanted to put them in our yard. I wanted to dig them up and then replant them. And I don't know how many years I did that, but they would never grow. I found out that the reason why it's because they were disturbed. I had disturbed them some kind of way. And when I went to replant them, the life had been drained out of them in some way, you know. So I was trying to figure out now, what did I do? But I fell in love with nature. 
And with all of this changing from being a sedentary, smoking kind of person to being a super fit, older runner, I relied on nature as well. So here's what nature does for me. Once you know what you need to do to be in line with how Mother Nature made the body, it is absolutely mind-blowing. Like the six-day races last year, 79 years old, I didn't need to I didn't need to stretch. I wasn't stiff. I didn't have anything and I'm looking around me at the other runners and I'm saying I don't need to do that. They had to go well there of course a medical tent. They were in the medical tent. They were getting blisters cut <laughs> from their toes and their feet. I had nothing. I also run in the very, very, very best shoes on the planet for running. And they come from where you are in England. And you need to check these shoes out if you do not know them. It's Vivo Barefoot. V and Victory. V-I-V-O, Vivo Barefoot. You can take those shoes and roll them up just like you could roll up a tissue. There's nothing in it. It's got a wide toe box. It's got no arch support. It's got no stability built in. The only thing they have is a sole that is penetration proof. So you're on a trail running and you got these little root tips and everything sticking up. Well, you won't cut your foot if you step on glass in these shoes. I've been running in these shoes and wearing these shoes for at least 12 years. These are the only shoes that I wear. You know, whether I'm dressing up to go somewhere or not. But they do have dress-up shoes, the same thing. And they have all kind of running shoes. And I did a, I, um, Dr. Merkin came out with a paper. And then there were two major research studies about um, running in your bare feet or in minimal shoes. One was in California in um, Stanford University, and you can look it up. And the other one was Harvard University, and you can look that up and just read what they say. So I've been running in barefoot, uh, uh, minimal shoes, I think a total of 15 years is when I've really made the change. And I was in regular conventional kind of New Balance or Asics or some of those other shoes that were built up with the heel and arch support and anything else that they can think to put in a shoe. I've not seen a shoe with the kitchen sink in it yet, Mm -hmm. but maybe in the future, they may think that that might help somebody get across the finish line faster. Nothing gets you across the finish line faster than either your bare feet or, for me, these Vivo barefoot shoes. It took me like five years to make the transition. My first thing was I read the research and I said, I got to try this. And I'm what? 65 years old. So I took my shoes off, went to went to a high school track, 400 meter track with the football field in the middle. And I ran on the grass. I said, I'm going to check it out to see. And it was great. Okay. The next step was 
Nike came out with some seven ounce minimal shoes. And I went to Nike's shoes and I ran in those shoes. Now they did have a heel and I'm looking for something more. And then they came out with a five ounce shoe and I did that for a while. Then they came out with the three ounce shoe, all Nike, and I did those for a while. And then I think you might know about the five fingers shoes, okay? I did those, I loved them, because there was nothing in them, there was nothing. You could roll those up also. And uh, by the way, I don't wear socks. That's another thing, I do not wear socks with any of my shoes and still no blisters. So I did Five Fingers and then for some reason, something happened to the company itself. And I, I was looking for another shoe and it was really cold here that year. And um, I needed a little bit more uh, something to, so my feet wouldn't freeze so much. And that's when I ran into Vivo. They had one store in America, in New York. I called them, talked to them. This was before they got into the running shoe business. And I found out that there was a shoe that the manager ran in, in New York, on the sidewalks. And I got those shoes. I um, ordered a pair and I loved them. And then about maybe a year or so later, Vivo came out with the, with the actually from the ground up running shoes that they designed. And I've been running in them ever since. They don't wear out. <laughs> they don't wear, there's nothing to break down. What has happened? Now, when I was in transition from the conventional shoes to these minimal shoes, knowing me, I'm very cautious, I went to the podiatrist and I said, here's what I'm thinking about doing. And I said, I would like for you to look at my feet, look at my legs and see if there is any reason that you can see that I shouldn't do this because I'm going to set myself up for something later on in my life because I'm already old. I, I think I was mid sixties and he looked and did all of that. I walked back and forth, you know, he's prodding and probing, you know, he said, you have bunions that don't bother you and you have a high arch. Okay, but you're fine. You, your feet are stable. And he said, editorial comment, he said, but if you were my mom, I would say don't do it <laughs> to my mom. Um, at your age, you just never know. And I said, to that nice podiatrist, I'm glad that you are not my son because I'm not asking for your permission other than if I'm going to hurt myself in some way, I won't do it. But you're telling me that I'm going to be okay. So he said, well, that's right. But here's what I would recommend. How about checking back in with me as you get into this, at least once a year? And that's what I've been doing. The only thing he can find is that my feet and my legs are so stable and so strong. I'm landing on the midfoot because if you're in minimal shoes and you're leaning, to engage gravity the way I do, then that's the strongest part of the foot to land on, not on your heel. Your heel is very vulnerable to all kinds of things. And sometimes 
It could be a calf muscle that speaks up because you're landing on your heel. Because when you land on your heel, you have two and a half times your body weight worth of force going up the back, the back of your leg, all the way up to your back. And too many times with too much force will give you all kinds of things from your hips all the way down, including your shin muscles and your calf muscles and your Achilles tendon and your plantar fascia and all kinds of things. I have not had one moment's problem running long. I mean, sometimes I've run, I don't know how many marathons a, a year. I've run marathons on each of the seven continents except for one continent. And you're going to think it was Antarctica. No, I did a marathon on Antarctica. <laughs> the one, con one uh, continent I did a half marathon. I actually did 22 miles and got credit for a half marathon on the Great Wall of China. Now, you're talking about quite an experience with up and down the Great Wall of China. And we did, we, we couldn't make it back to finish the race on the actual wall because they were opening it up to tourists and people at the water stop didn't speak English out in the boonies there uh, three hours from Beijing that's <laughs> where the marathon took place so one person was dehydrated and really in trouble so by the time we got them to understand what was going on, even though she was throwing up over there on the side, they didn't get it. So finally, they got her some help, and we were delayed and didn't get back on the wall in time. So at some point, I'll go back and finish that seventh continent. But I do a lot of running, a lot of outside running. I also run in the deep water. I teach deep water running for the for the county here, Montgomery County Rec Association. I teach teach deep water running. So I'm helping people understand how to set up the body. And that's what I want to tell you about setting up your body so that you can run in line with how Mother Nature made for your body to run. If you do this you will, I won't go as far as to say that you will wipe out injuries because I don't know what you're eating. <laughs> I want you to eat fruits and vegetables and whole grains and beans and seeds and nuts and ginger and make sure, as a runner, make sure that you eat chia seed for your runs. I don't do junk food. I take my food to all of my runs. And chia seed is a major part. And I want you to look up chia seed and you can see it's very nutritious. It has a lot of vitamins and minerals and protein. And it doesn't have that many calories. So that's a tip. It's a tip for you because chia seed is, I believe, what keeps me out there running without uh, losing energy. So back to the, the way to set up your body. So number one, it's good posture. If you do not have good posture, you can check yourself out in the mirror, stand sideways. And look at yourself and stand as if you think you know that you have good posture. And look at yourself and see if your ear is over your shoulder and your shoulder joint 
is over your hip joint and your hip joint is over your ankle joint. Got that straight line. In order to do that, especially let's look at the um, core and the waistline. That's where you usually have trouble with your posture. I know you guys are in England, but that's okay because Michael Jackson, when he was alive and and out there, um, you know, doing his dancing on the stage and all of that. See if you can look him up on the internet and watch how he dances. Watch how he levels his pelvis when he dances. Every now and then he'll do that thing where he's like taking his pelvis up and down, up and down, up and down. Well, he was leveling his pelvis because once your pelvis is level, it stabilizes your entire body. And in order to level your pelvis and keep it level, you have to do the kind of things that I do early in the morning that I talked about a little earlier. You do not have to do it for two hours. You, can, I'm talking about strengthening your core. It's got to be strong. If you're going to be any kind of runner, you've got to have a strong core. If you do not have a strong core, you cannot have good posture. And the posture makes it with the core and the middle, the trunk of your body. So take a look in the mirror, see where you are, go to the website, check out Michael Jackson, and then stand in the mirror and do Michael Jackson's pelvis. That's how I teach it in my deep water running class and as I'm coaching people for outside running. Same thing, same body, same alignment, beginning with the core. Got to be strong. Got to be strong as you're running six days or a marathon or a 10-miler or a 5K, whatever. Got to be strong because if it isn't, your form will break down. It definitely will. There's no question about it. If you can ever look at people who are not well-trained, meaning that they have strong core to hold the pelvis level for stability of the entire body, you will see them dragging at the end of a marathon. And when you see that, you know they've set themselves up for injury. So. That's what you can do. Look in that mirror. Okay, the other thing is this. I see a lot of people moving their arms with their shoulders. The shoulders were not made to move the arms. The shoulders were made to be relaxed, whether you're running or not. This, again, is part of good posture. You move your arms from the shoulder joint. So you, again, stand in the mirror and see if your shoulders move, if you move your arms back and forth. Do a 90-degree elbow and move your arm back and forth and see if your shoulders will move. They should not move. And while we are looking at ourselves, moving our arms back and forth, make sure that your ear is over your shoulder because if your ear is not over your shoulder, your poor little head will be hanging down. And once your head moves down, it will be 40 pounds or 50 pounds, depending how old you are, heavy, which is lift your upper body in the back is lifting 40 pounds or 50 pound weights. That's your head. And then sometimes you see older people with, with not good posture because their head, the ear hasn't been over the shoulder. To make the head sit squarely on the vertebrae in your neck, 
which sits on a vertebrae in your spine, which was made by nature to take that kind of weight because nature said at some point, okay, you guys, no longer on our fours. We're going to put you straight up and we're going to do this uh, spine so that it can handle the weight of your head. Okay, so make sure that that ear is over the shoulder. Your arms are being moved from the shoulder joint and your shoulders are down and relaxed. If you put that ear over the shoulder and, and practice that when you're not running, you can practice it. No one will know what you're practicing. And it's okay. You can practice that. You know, I even made some little um, frisbee kind of, um, little frisbee kinds of things that you, you know, you throw out. And, <laughs> and I give it to the people that I coach. And I sign it for them, you know. I autograph these little frisbee kind of things that can fit right on their head. And I tell them, wear this in your house because it will make sure that your head is squarely on your shoulders. Uh, I mean, uh, on your um, vertebrae in your neck. And your ear is squarely over the shoulder. You know, they look at me and they laugh. I said, hey. Whatever works, do that. <laughs> it, it works. Because what you have to do is you have to practice whatever you're trying to change enough times so that your mind can grab it. Well, otherwise, your mind will never grab it. So you will always, even if you, even if you think you're going to keep that ear over the shoulder when you're running, you won't. You got to make the change. These changes have to be made in your mind. Otherwise, they won't be made. You've talked a lot about like the, the physical side of running and the strength and the balance and um, you know the flexibility and the core strength and good posture. I'd love for you to share some of your wisdom and knowledge around the mental side of running. You know the mental resilience, the, the mental grit. Oh, this is wonderful. Because running should be like moving meditation. I do meditate in the morning and I meditate when I'm running. I'm well aware of where I am and all of that. But I am really not there. I'm running above the ground. And the only way to get your mental part of your body into that kind of running, your body has to know exactly what to do. And it is doing it in line with how nature made your body to move. Okay. I'll tell you, I've been doing running the Chi running way, C-H-I, Chi running way for I know, I don't know how long. And I can set up the body with good posture and good alignment, and I can lean from my ankles with everything straight. With Michael Jackson's pelvis, everything straight. So I'm not bending at the waist. I'm bending, I'm leaning from the ankles, and I'm straight up like a pencil that you could put on the table with the lid pointed on the table and just kind of let it lean. That's the way your body should look so that you do not kill your lower back by leaning at the waist. And then all you do is lean a little to warm up and lean more once you get warmed up and you're cruising along. That way, your body is doing something in line with how it was designed. So it's not going to interfere with your mental part of your running. It's just there. And all you need to do is fall forward. Your, your knee will come down under you. Your heel will come up behind you because you're falling. You're not pushing off or anything. You're falling. And if you fall enough, 
Mother Nature is going to take care of your not falling on your face. Because that knee is going to go under you, under your body mass, and your heel will come up behind you. And the, and the more you lean, it's like your gas pedal. The more you lean, the faster you will go with not that much more energy. But in order to hold the lean, it goes back to the alignment and Michael Jackson. So I meditate. I get to the point sometimes where I'm running above the ground. I feel like I'm running above the ground. You're caressing the ground with your midfoot. So you never hear the boom, boom, boom that you hear some runners when they're going by you. You know, they're hitting the ground so hard, all that energy is going into the ground. So finishing a marathon or whatever, at this stage of the game, for me as a runner, is like heaven. It's like running on a cloud. Your whole body, including your mind, is involved in the running. But it all goes back to alignment and posture. You can't do anything that I'm talking about unless you have good posture and you can find information about good posture on the internet, how to set it up and how to train around good posture so that you can make it an unconscious move rather than a conscious move. If it's a conscious move, know that you won't do it forever because your body will just go back to what it knows. And if it has to go back to what it knows, it's going to wake you up and interfere with your meditating as you run because your heel might be hurting or you get a cramp in your muscle, uh, your calf muscle or something like that. But if everything is moving like a well-oiled machine, you know, one of those, those slick looking cars that you see out there sometimes, and everything is doing what it is supposed to do, what it has been designed to do. It's got enough high quality kind of gas and your high quality gas. It's going to be high quality food. And you just, you're out there and you just move like that eagle that you see flying above. And that eagle is not thinking about anything except the next meal probably, and he'd be looking out for that. But the mental part of running, for me, is what takes care of whatever stress you might have. It settles you down. It helps you to be more creative. It helps you to think more clearly. It validates your life, in a sense, because there's nothing in between you and feeling like you are, are flying through the air like that eagle. Nothing. It takes some doing to get there, but it's worth it. Betty, I heard that you were writing a book nature's path to ageless aging i wrote a book about my life and how i got started and how i rely on nature and i talk about alignment what i talked about here and the posture and <coughs> excuse me and i talk about uh, tree running and i make a case for ordering your life in line with how Mother Nature made the body and in line with running, sort of as the core. If you can focus on what you love and what you're passionate about, for me, definitely the running, and I would say the movement, because the swimming is the same, the deep water running is the same, Tai Chi is the same, and being able to climb a tree (laughs) with your grandkids who are 13 and 14 right now, you know, 
that's like heaven on earth. But if you could, rather than focusing and letting your ego take charge of your life, where you would do anything to get to the finish line, you know, your calf muscle is whispering to you, not even yelling yet. And you keep moving rather than stopping at the medical tent to check it out. You keep moving. Don't do that. Let your, the other part of your whole life support your running, not take away from it. And then for me, I want, I want to run until I find that special tree one morning. And felt good enough to go out to run to find that tree, sit under that tree. And then the body will say, that is it. <laughs> I'm fine with that. I want to run for the rest of my life. I don't care if I live to be 110 or I could get go much sooner. Doesn't matter. I want to be able to feel good enough and healthy enough and fit enough to be able to get out there to run. And I coined a word called passion virence. It's passion and perseverance together. They both have the same weight together. And if you can take that on with your running or your movement of any kind, then you are probably more likely to take better care. And I'm not saying, see, the body doesn't care. It only wants you to be healthy and be fit. The body doesn't care about the finish line. I don't care about the finish line. Now, I've been around, um, I've run in every state here in the United States. And I've met an awful lot of, of um, people at the finish line with their, uh, the timing people, do the timing. And I know them because I go back to these races lots of times. And they're always getting me <laughs> about the clock is moving. Why are you standing there looking at that bird in the tree? <laughs> I don't care about the finish line. <laughs> you know, I'm the I'm the start run. If I do everything that I should do to get myself that I can control to get myself to the start line, I've done all of the training, I've done the eating, I've done, you know, all of the morning exercises and the stretching and all of that, and I get to the start line, I don't need to worry about the finish line because it will take care of itself. Now, sometimes there are things that happen that you cannot control, like a thunderstorm or something, or for me, a great, beautiful bird, <laughs> you know, and a tree that catches my attention. The finish line definitely will take care of itself. So in this book, Lifestyle by Nature, which is available on Amazon, it gives you six steps that I took to have a more healthy, more fit life. And you're making, this is about the process of change, to change a lifestyle. It's not about changing to run a 10 miler or qualify for Boston, nothing like that. It's not about losing a certain number of pounds so that you can look good at your 10th year high school reunion. Not about that. It's about your entire lifestyle. So think the big picture. And the first step is internal strength. You have to have internal strength because it's going to take some strength for you to stay on this path, the perseverance part. And you're going to look back in your life and you're going to find something that helped you to know that you had the strength. So it's all kinds of things. For me, it was back in 1956, integrating 
a very, very high quality public high school coming from a segregated black uh, high school, ninth grade, with substandard everything, books and teachers, everything. And I went into this and I made it through and everything else was still segregated around. That was t tough because it was two black girls and we integrated the 10th grade, but the school had 3,500. And I came from a school that may have had two or 300. So my internal strength, I knew that I was strong back then. I didn't know what I was gonna do with that strength from inside of myself, but it was internal. And then the second is work on, educate yourself about the relationship between your mind and your body. You have to know that they both can influence each other. Mind can influence the body, the body can influence the mind. Know how it works, because as you are making these changes, you need to know that your mind might sabotage you or your body might, and you need to have some kind of handle on what that means and how to combat that. And then the third step is nutrition and movement. And we talked a lot about nutrition already and about the movement. And you got to make it subconscious. In this process, you make it subconscious. And in the book, it tells you some tips on how to make that happen. And then the fourth step is if you do the mind-body thing, and if you do the nutrition movement thing, and of course you have the strength to hang in there, you will cross what I call the lifestyle change line. Once you cross that line, everything becomes much easier because now you're making your way into making this a subconscious lifestyle move rather than something so that you can show up looking cute or handsome at your 10th reunion of high school. Okay, so the lifestyle change line told me, it told me when I was there because I stopped wanting anything that mimic or tasted like anything that I had given up because it wasn't good for me. So I wasn't looking for a veggie burger that would mimic a hamburger. I didn't want any of that. And food took on a completely different approach for me. I only wanted food that would support my running. <laughs> So I didn't want chemicals. So I went organic, vegan, non-junk food, organic, okay? That's after I crossed the lifestyle change line. And then number five, ongoing challenges. You know that you will fall off the wagon here and there, you're human. And you expect that. Okay, you always have challenges, even within your family or your friends. They will always say, oh, come on, it's your birthday. You can have three pieces of cake. And, you know, you might have that cake, but, you know, it's a challenge. You get back on that path. And then number six is now you're there and all you need to do is maintain it. So it's healthier outcomes and you maintain your way of living, your new lifestyle has kicked in, and you are there. So it sounds like a lot. It takes time. Anything worth doing, worth changing, it's going to take time. Your body and your brain moves that way. There's not very much you can do to speed it, speed it, speed it up, but if you are passionate and you have passion veerance about being healthy and fit with supporting your running, which will help you to be healthy and fit in itself, 
then you will hang in there and do this. If not, then every person that I've run with over all of these years, I'm a member of the Montgomery County Roadrunners and I also coach for them uh, as a volunteer. And I have a lot of tips that I give over the years with all of my 12, it was 12 of us in a group. We trained together, we ran together, we traveled to run marathons around the world together. Not one is running today. I'm the only one in the group. I didn't take Advil <laughs> for the pain when we were doing those long runs. They would take the Advil. I didn't eat all of the saturated fat after getting to the place where we could eat. So I always bought my own food or grab an apple or an orange because I wasn't starving to death because of my chia seed. Okay? So it's a lifestyle and it's Nothing at all like getting up in the morning and feeling healthy, no pain at all, and can take on whatever the, the day presents to you. I just finished 901 mile virtual race. I ran from virtually from Key West, Florida, up the west coast of Florida to Alabama. 901 miles, and now I'm going to run back. It was only one way, but a few of us really had so much fun doing it because along the way, we could see where we were by computer. In the west coast of Florida, is a beautiful place. So I'm going to run back, and then I'm just going to find what's next for me would be whatever virtual races that I can sign up for and wait until the virus does its thing and it leaves, <laughs> it leaves the earth. I don't want it to go to Mars or anywhere else, but it leaves the earth and maybe we can get back to our regular kind of running. But it has not stopped me from running outside. I'm running still over 100 miles a week between my own running and I run with the people that I coach. And it hasn't interfered with that at all. So I don't know if you can do questions. Dr. Betty, you're just so impressive. Like there's, there's so many amazing pieces of advice and information. It's been absolutely inspiring are you on social media can people follow you online um that's something that i decided that it wasn't well i won't say it wasn't worth it but i i will uh, respond to emails so you can do my email but i don't have time to set up anything and then monitor it and feedback with it as i say i'm still coaching and then I volunteer. I have a, a kids group that I work with. I volunteer. And I do deep water. I teach deep water running and I do deep water running for myself. The, the pools are now closed, but the outdoor pools are open. So they switched me to shallow water walking, which is the same posture, the same alignment. And, and moving is a little bit different. So I'm there at the pool most mornings. I meet people <laughs> at the track or wherever we're going to run, the ones that I'm coaching. I'm beginning at the earliest at 6 o'clock, and that's like five or six days a week. And then I do my long runs, and I'm doing this virtual race. I, I'm, I'm busy with things that I think are more worth it. I think for me, it's relationship-based interactions, much more than the computer. And I know my grandkids tell me you need to text and you need to do this and that and the other with the computer and the technology. I respect it, but I'm nearly 80. <laughs> and 
you talk to your grandmother or your great grandmother, they may have the same kind of thing. But then there are some that are up to date. So it's it's hard for me. Uh, people would like to get in touch. This book, Lifestyle by Nature, will answer some of your questions, and I can um, do uh, do the emails if you really have a question, and uh, Sarah, I can. How how else can I do that? <laughs> no, I think that's perfect, Betty. What I'll do is I'll make sure that I put the link to your book in the show notes so that people can find the book first of all and take a read of that book before they um before they reach out to you because I know you are one busy lady. You have a lot going on and you I are do. Still, you and are I love still, it. <laughs> I love it. And you're still running, you know, a huge amount of miles every single week, which is which is incredible and so, so inspiring. But Dr. Betty, thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast to share. Well, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciated it. It was fun. And I like to to give what I've tested and tried and know that it works after all of these years. And that, that you know, everybody should have access to this kind of, my, my coaching is very different from any other coaching that I know of. So it's in line with how the body was made to move and what the body needs. And that equals longevity in running with less or no need to take time off on the sofa because you have a pulled muscle here or there. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Betty. You've shared so much wisdom and I know it is going to motivate and inspire so many women and girls to think, right, time to get my trainers on, to look at my posture, to get out running and just start, you know, do, doing what you've shared, you know, which has been absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much. That was just an amazing episode with Dr. Betty, one absolute legend. So everything that we have talked about today will be available in the show notes at toughgirlchallenges.com. Just want to make one other podcast recommendation. Go and take a listen to Rosie Swale Pope. She is 73 years young and we spoke to Rosie last year in November 2019 when she was on her run from the UK, so the United Kingdom. She's running all the way to Kathmandu in Nepal. Um, So I actually ended up meeting Rosie Rosie in December in Istanbul in Turkey and there's a vlog that you can watch you can go and watch that on the Tough Girl Challenges YouTube channel but Rosie is another phenomenal woman who is out there living her best life running every single day she has had to come back from Turkey now due to Covid and she's currently running the length of Great Britain with her cart that she drags behind her but please do go take a listen to that episode with Rosie Swale Pope absolutely inspiring if you want to hear more incredible episodes then please do support the tough girl podcast by visiting patreon.com forward slash tough girl podcast so patreon.com forward slash tough girl podcast you can support in sterling us dollars and euros you can support monthly you can support annually or you can make a one-off donation via paypal all the information is available at toughgirlchallenges.com i will be back with you next tuesday for another awesome episode of the tough girl podcast bye